welcome to Awake Ones. I'm Alexandra Wenman. And I'm Lorraine Flaherty. And we're very excited to be back together because Laurie and I have both been off on some incredible adventures in different parts of the world. And today we want to talk about Laurie's adventure in India. So tell us, you went to New Delhi, am I right? I did, I did. tell us what drew you to New Delhi at this time of year. Well, it was all due to a little miracle that my book seems to be creating for me because it was bought by an Indian publisher and is out in India but under the name of Your Past Lives and uh, it seems to be doing quite well out there apparently. And so somebody read it and she decided that she, as a a birthday treat for herself, was going to come to London and see me for some sessions. And while she was here, she also decided that she was going to do some training with me. So she did the Future Life Progression training. And when we'd finished the training, she decided that she wanted to do some more. And it was going to be quite a while before she could get back to the UK. So she said, well, of course, you could come to India. And I said, okay. (laughs) Why not? <laughs> and, and she was just about to launch into all the reasons why and kind of went, what, sorry? So what did you think do? about? <laughs> she just said yes. And I said, yes, actually, I have a window in November because, strangely enough, my diary was, uh, you know, quite open. Although you and I, you know, potentially might have done a trip together. So there was this gap. And uh, so the next thing I know, I'm getting on a plane and going to, going to New Delhi, which... It was very exciting because probably nearly 30 years ago, I think, was the first time I was in India. And I went travelling around Goa. And then a few years later, I went back and, and went to Kerala. And I absolutely loved it. And it was one of those moments where I landed and got off the plane and just burst into tears because mm. I thought I'd come home. And I know that India is my spiritual home, so I've been waiting for the the right reason. And, you know, I never go places unless I get the call or unless there's a particular reason to go there. But India has been on the list for a very long time. So it just, yeah, it just felt completely right to to go out there. And so I was going out to teach and uh, she'd organised for a talk for me, which I did at the India International Centre, which was an amazing venue. And I, yeah, I just got to meet some really incredible people and we did a little bit of travelling as well, we did a little bit of, bit of sightseeing as well as eating some of the most amazing food. <laughs> just, I don't think my, my Instagram was just full of, I had to stop in the end because one of my friends said, will you just stop it because you're just making my mouth water. It was all like amazing food and then beautiful draped scarves. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, scarves. No, you looked like very colors, beautiful yeah. while you were eating very yes. beautiful food. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the whole thing's a bit of an adventure really. And of course Delhi is, you know, it's, it's such a busy capital. I mean, I think there's more people per, you know, per, per you know, plot of land than in in most countries and you know so the energy is very high and it's in some ways frenetic but in other ways it's just very fluid and very flowing and 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 very easy and and you know there's a there's a lot of a lot of gentleness and a lot of a lot of loveliness out there as well Oh, that's so cute. I know, she came back with a little head jiggle and like, <laughs> yeah, was all like, oh, yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> but you, you had some um, quite extraordinary experiences with some of the, the sites out there, didn't yeah. you? So tell us about the Taj Mahal, because you have yeah, quite a story. I about did, it. yeah. So the Taj was a bit of a surprise. Obviously, you can't go to New Delhi and not go to the Taj. And so after we'd finished all the teaching and the talks, we'd uh, arranged to get out there. And, and you kind of leave really early in the morning to try and miss the traffic. And because uh, it gets how early we're talking. Uh, we're talking about getting up at four o'clock in the morning. And what's the traffic like at that time of day? It's still busy. <laughs> it's still busy. Not as busy it was when we came back. It took us two and a half hours to get there, and then it took us five hours to get back. Oh my god! Five, five hours. hours to get back. Yes, yeah, so we didn't get back until wow. quite late at night. And uh, yeah, I'd gone out there, and obviously the story that we hear is that the Taj is this beautiful monument of love that this man built for his wife. That's all I knew about it, really. It never even occurred to me to check any more of the history of it. So when I got there, thinking I was going to be bathed in this lovely energy of love, I walked in and thought, 
<laughs> I'm not sure what that is, but it definitely didn't feel very much like love. And it was like a wall of despair and uh, anger and frustration and loss. And I mean, it was just so many different energies that I was feeling and all of these souls that were kind of still milling around for some reason. So when I tuned in, I thought, oh, I don't know what this is, but I did a, did a bit clearing while I was there. And we had a guide taking us around and, you know, and he was very sweet. And so I was, of course, really questioning him and trying to get the history out of him. And it became apparent that the Taj had originally been built. I think it was meant to be a palace, mm -hmm. actually. I think it was meant to be a, a home. And the mogul leader who was building it, who was very much in love with his wife, but obviously they, they had done quite an active... <laughs> love life as well because they ended up having 14, 14 children only which uh, seven of them had survived. survived yeah and she died in childbirth she mm. died I think giving birth to the, the last of the children sounds like it was only a matter of time <laughs> well yeah yeah it's like in those days I know absolutely so when she died before it was actually finished so it then became her tomb he then uh, devoted it to her but when it was finished because he wanted to make sure that the architect and the, the builders that had created it never did anything like that again, instead of kind of paying them off or, you know, just requesting that they didn't do that, he actually cut off all their hands. Nice guy. It's a bit extreme. And so I thought, ah, oh, right, well, that might explain some of, you know, the energies yeah, that I'm, I'm picking up. And then... It turned out that one of his sons, I'm not sure if it was the youngest one, but one of the younger ones, who obviously in that society it's the eldest son that kind of you know inherits everything and the other ones don't really get too much, bumped off all his brothers so that he would be the one that ended up in charge mm. and then imprisoned his father, locked him up and for the rest of his life. And he'd actually imprisoned him in the Agra Fork and it was in a, you know, in a cell over there where this was kind of the ultimate torture. And if you like the ultimate karmic kind of revenge, because he spent his days looking at the, just a, a small view of the Taj off in the distance. Mm. You could just see it from the, from the fort. So when we actually went to the fort afterwards, it was the same. I walked in there expecting it to be a battlefield and soldiers and army, but it was just this absolute deep 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 despair so I had to do a big clearing there as well it was yeah imagine spending your whole life building something like that and then and building it for the person that you do love yeah and the grief at losing her and then yeah having the sun turn on you I mean he karmically cutting off everyone's hands probably wasn't that great but yeah then spending you know then the remainder of your life looking through a tiny window at your creation I mean, any wonder you were hit with this wall yeah, of grief. It, it's... Absolutely. But it, it did occur to me as well, though, that the son who'd been responsible for all of that, because obviously, you know, in the work that Alan and I do, it's all about uh, looking for forgiveness and looking for causes and reasons why these things happen. And it did strike me that, you know, he, this, this child would have lost his mother, so he wouldn't have the mother's love. And then father probably wasn't going to be too happy with the children who had taken away the love of his life. And I don't know whether this was the son that was the one that she died in, that childbirth. She died in childbirth with. Would make sense. It would make sense. But even if he wasn't, you know, this man that is in absolute grief may not have been able to give the love to his children. And therefore, there could have been a battle, you know, an emotional mm. battle between them. And then if you're a child and you witness this man, you know, pretty much destroy all of these people who have given so much and created something of such beauty, it would turn your mind a little mm. bit. I don't think you would have the most compassion for, for that person. You might not person. have a lot of so, respect. For <laughs> not a yeah. lot, no. So actually, I just I, I felt such a sense of, of compassion for all of them, really, and, and for what had happened, and those power struggles that, that went on over there. So yeah, it just it wasn't what I was expecting at all. Wow, and in terms of, obviously, the, 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 the culture over there, there's a lot of... Um, I guess there's a mixture of different energies, isn't there, in yeah. terms of it's very spiritual, but you probably get lots of different threads of spirituality and a real mixture of kind of what goes on. And So did you experience um, 
any of that did you see sort of some of the the different kinds of temples and shrines and, yeah. and things yeah happening? we went to a lot so we went to my my, my friend that i was staying out there with was taking me to lots of markets and doing lots of shopping and i kept saying can we go to a temple now <laughs> <laughs> i'm already into the shopping so much and so yeah we explored lots of different ones and to be honest there's temples everywhere mm -hmm. you know you're just driving down the side of the road and you know they're, they're, they're scattered everywhere there's just these you know little, little square blocks and there's a statue in there and people go in and offer blessings so it's a very sacred they're very aware of the spirituality it's everywhere i think my favorite one was um there's a, a huge uh, kind of um overpass uh, uh, and my friend said to me, look over to the right. And as we went past, there was a huge temple to Hanuman, who is the, the, the monkey god. And there's actually a life-size statue of him, over, you know, which is in front of the, the, the temple. And you actually go in through his legs. Oh. <laughs> his legs are kind of around the door. So I'm not sure they really thought that one <laughs> through when they were building it. I was like, okay, but it's pretty impressive. That'd be yeah. a very fertile temple. Yeah, I think it would be a very fertile <laughs> temple. But so uh, a lot, you've got the little ones at the side of the road. But then there were quite a few. I was quite surprised at how many South Indian temples there were. And those ones are the ones that are really brightly coloured. Mm. And lots of blues and lots of yellows and golds and, and stuff. So, yeah, we went in and explored lots of, the, lots of the different ones. And a lot of the Sikh temples as well where what was really really lovely especially when you know it's a country of extremes so there's a lot of wealth but there's a lot of poverty but you know i was amazed at how well people are kind of taken care of mm -hmm. out there so you know you quite often see people dropping off food bags to mm -hmm. the, the ones that were homeless and, and you know living in not so great sites but in the sikh temples you know there's a and there's a massive one right in the center of new delhi you know anyone that's hungry they'll feed them Mm, that's so lovely. And so we went into the Chani Chok, which is the, 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 the market of the moon, which is probably one of the biggest markets, I think, <laughs> almost in the world. And was, I mean, it was just intense. That one was really crazy. And uh, there's a huge Sikh temple there. And you could see at dinner time, there was a huge long line, a huge queue of people. And, you know, and they will, everybody gets a hot meal and everyone gets taken care of. So, you know, even in amongst all of that, and uh, you know, and there wasn't. I don't really. See, you, you do get people begging, but to be honest, probably not that more than I've seen. You know, sometimes in yeah. London and in, in places that you go to. Because they do say it, there's parts of India where it's really shocking poverty, isn't it? But you didn't get to see like the what? real extreme. I mean, you see bits of it, but I think it's... Mumbai is probably meant to be the worst. I think maybe. But as I said, there was even even the dogs seemed to be really well cared for. You yeah. know, there was. There was a, a really, I don't know, just a sense that people did care and people did kind look of look after, after each other. other. Yeah. yeah, so that, that bit was really, really lovely. It's cute. I remember reading that book, Shantaram, and, you know, all about how he lived in the slums and he sort yeah. of became the slum doctor even though he was an escape criminal and wasn't really a doctor. <laughs> but you talk about the, you know, the abject poverty, but yeah. still the joy that exudes from these people. Yeah. Just to be happy with you know, what they've got, you know, even if they have a tiny bit, the gratitude, and yeah. that's the bit, I think, that the rest of the world could really learn from, that 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 place of absolute joy. Yeah, indeed. In and their, I, seeing the blessing in everything, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that I love about India so much anyway, is that there is, and especially because obviously, um, you know, the Hindu tradition, you know, there's a belief in reincarnation, and they are, you know, they are very spiritual, I think, in, in many ways. And so there is a lot of awareness of the sacred and there are a lot of offerings and a lot of blessings and you know there is a lot of not just prayer for prayer's sake but yeah there is you know it's kind of built into daily life and while I was there it was actually Diwali and Diwali is kind of their equivalent of Christmas and it's the festival of lights so everything is lit up it's wow. really beautiful all the houses and the shops and the trees everything's sparkly and really lovely and then uh, you know like, like we have at Christmas everyone exchanges gifts but what I really loved was that all of the gifts were very practical and they were very usable so it would be beautiful trays of dried fruits or nuts so things that and everyone was kind of exchanging or candles beautiful candles that you would use 
in your offerings and in your uh, your blessings. So they were, they were useful things. It wasn't people just going out and buying stuff for the sake of stuff. They were things that people would... Thoughtful and simple. Yeah, yeah, it was simple stuff. And I got to partake in the actual Diwali, the, the house that I was staying in, the, um, the puja, the actual offerings and the blessings. And that was really lovely to be a part of it, to be there with the family. And, uh, and it was the... Um, yeah, uh, my, my friend's mother-in-law who was, you know, hosting and, and I got to get dressed up. I had a, an outfit made and a traditional outfit and it was just lovely and lots of, lots of parties and lots of celebrations and people coming together and, uh, and, and again, lots of family. Oh, and one of the traditions that I thought was really, really wonderful, they have a couple of days after Diwali, it's a brother and sister ceremony that they do and so the... the I think the sister gives the brother, or it goes the other way, I can't remember which way round it is, or maybe maybe it's both, but they, they tie a little thing around and then the brother promises to protect and honour the sister. And then the sister gives a, a you know, they and I think he gives her a gift or they exchange gifts as a, a, a signal of their kind of loyalty and their that's protection for That's how it should be, right? Yeah, it's really sweet. Feminine. That's so cute. Yeah, yeah, so that was really lovely. Oh, that and on top of all of the amazing food. Yeah, the food just looks oh. incredible. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. What was your favourite um, dish that you had out there? So, well, my favourite is masala dosa, which is a South Indian dish anyway. And uh, so I was very excited because I wasn't sure if I'd get it in Delhi because it is a South Indian dish. So I had that a few times. That was amazing. But uh, some of the street food, the, um, they have these little... Uh, that they're like little paste. It was not even a pastry. It's oh, I don't know how you describe it. So uh, almost like a like a poppadom mm. type of thing, but it's hollow, and then they fill it up with yogurt and chickpeas and various different oh, spices. Yeah. And then it's and it, but it's actually quite big, and you put it in your mouth, and then, and then you have to bite, and then there's this explosion of flavour and taste. And so those were pretty cool. Yeah. I liked those. Those oh. were amazing. And then there was some other dish that was, it was a bit like spinach. And then some other, I think he called it a good. So it, it, they kind of mash it up. It's almost a bit like aubergine. Mm. So they make this paste and then he makes these really crispy, uh, like roti breads. And then that you put that on the, with, with, with a little bit of butter. And then you sprinkle a little bit of its raw sugar cane that's just been yeah. literally grated on top of it and the flavours because you get the crunchiness the richness of the butter then you get that soft spicy green vegetable and then this little hit of sugar on the top of it I mean that was my taste buds were just saying oh, hey, I love you <laughs> and especially being vegetarian is where you get a lot yeah. of amazing vegetarian food don't yeah. you yeah and at my friend's house they have a cook and uh, he was just amazing. And at first, I think he was a little bit worried with me with spicy food. They, they thought that I wasn't going to be able to handle it. And so it was very mild the first day. And I said, no, 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 it's okay. Bring it's on okay. the chilli. I put chilli and everything. So it's all right. I'm fine. And uh, so he was just good. And I'm, I learned some Hindi words so that I can speak to him because he didn't really speak any English. And so I wanted to congratulate him. So I was learning all of these amazing words like Danyavad, which is thank you, and Shukriya, and uh, Bariahe, which means very, very good. So, of course, he would come out, I'd eat this food, and I would be in raptures. And because I was really loving it, it he would just go off chuckling to himself. And then the <laughs> next day, you know, and, and him and my friend would just, you know, they'd plan all these amazing things. So I think he was having an adventure as well because he was then running off and thinking, right, what can I feed her next? So Aww. breakfast, lunch and dinner, I was getting four or five different dishes. I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> like, I really <laughs> had to stop eating. I was just, I could feel myself getting bigger and bigger, but it was so delicious. It's all right, because you can just wear a floaty scarf. Yeah, I know, the <laughs> I learned the art of draping scarves. <laughs> <laughs> it's a multitude of sins and stretchy clothes. Next time I go, never mind taking bigger suitcases, I'm just going to take lots of stretchy clothes. No, I learned, actually, <laughs> I learned after a while that what I had to do was to just take really small bite-sized portions of everything because there was just always going to be more and even visiting I, I had never realized 
just how similar India and Ireland mm. really are and the customs that they have because we would go and visit people and they were feeding you and then they'd say would you like some tea and of course you know I'm Irish so I'm always going to say yes to tea but tea in Ireland isn't just tea you know it's cake and it's cookies and it's whatever and then you'd offend people if you didn't say yes to it and over there it they would bring they'd just bring out wherever I went a trolley and it would be all these delicious mouth-watering little snacks like little crisps even the even the cornflakes one of the dishes was these spicy cornflakes with little bits of chili and then other little mm. um other little crunchy bits in there and so yeah everyone and I, and I they were so delicious that I couldn't say no and of course my excuse was that I would offend people if I didn't eat it so it was only out of the goodness of my heart that I was eating all of this stuff yeah so you could have come back with a suitcase full of food I <laughs> did come back with a suitcase so I, I certainly came back with a camera full of photographs of the food yeah she did and she came back with a suitcase full of amazing shopping and like you should see the handbag she got me it's yeah. like all bills all whistles yeah. like totally up there. there's stuff out there is amazing it is amazing so it's you know I'm, this is I'm I'm wearing bright colours I'm just very grateful that I'm not a bright coloured sparkly person because I would have been in real real trouble you would have spent everything I would but it is yeah but it's a, it's a magical place I love it and you know I'm, I've been invited to come back and do some more teaching well you see your book sold out over my there, book sold it? out yeah so I went and ordered some copies and uh for my talk, which all sold out, and then I went to get some more to bring them home with me, and uh, the yeah, the, the publisher's run had actually run out, so fingers crossed they're gonna do a reprint. So yeah, because the, the the bookshop wanted me to come and do a talk out there, but uh, yeah, we'll just have to see. Yeah, maybe we need to take away ones on the road to India. I I'm quite ready to do. Uh, go and partake in some of this amazing food and shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the one thing that you came away from this trip learning from these people? Just the... Well, I mean, it felt like I'd gone out and met my spiritual family and, you know, I recognised that the world over, people are searching for answers mm. and for deeper meanings to things and, that you know, whether I was scrabbling around in a market, you know, whether I was at a very, you know, very nice, very posh Gymkhana club right in the centre of New Delhi, that the people were so open and warm and it's a place that, it is a place of extremes, but I just recognise that you know there is beauty and you know connections and just yeah love wherever you go really so and that's what I feel it's a very warm warm place so generous so open and uh, yeah I just I can't wait to go back and explore more and so we're, I'm kind of planning my next my next trip and uh, you know doing a bit more bit more traveling over there and seeing a bit more of this wonderful place amazing Exciting! Can't wait to see more pictures. So, how do we say thank you in uh, Hindi? Uh, Danyavad or Shukriya, depending oh. on, on where you are. Shukriya and Danyavad <laughs> for, for watching. <laughs>